I want to tell you about one of my favorite paradoxes that comes up in what's called reinforcement learning. When you clicked on this video, you sent a signal to the YouTube algorithm that reinforces that you probably like math or STEM content. And now the algorithm is going to be even more likely to show you similar content. Now, one simple model for this kind of reinforcement is given by something called Polya's urn. This video, by the way, is sponsored by FlexiSpot, the makers of my brand new standing desk. Uh, a little bit more about them at the end of the video. If I take an urn, this is the closest thing I could find in my house, and I've got a white and a red little ball inside of it. Now, if I close my eyes and randomly grab one of them, I've got a white one. How it works is I'm going to find a second white one and I'm going to put them both back into the urn, which means that now I've got two whites and one red. So if I do that again, going in, reaching in, trying to find one of the balls, one of the pom-poms, I suppose, it was more likely to be white because there were more whites, and now that reinforces that there's whites, I'm going to put them both back in. And I can keep on with this process. I'm going to reach in and, okay, this time I managed to get a red one, that's good, a little bit more of a mixture, and I can keep going and going as long as I wish. As I continue, I'm going to get some distribution of red and white balls like this one. Here are plots of a proportion of white balls over time, and while it does tend to stabilize, the eventual proportion can be quite different based on those initial fluctuations. But what about a scenario that is just like really bad, like you get a whole bunch of whites only at the beginning? If I started that way, well, now it is just less and less likely that I would select a red ball just because there's so many white balls. I get trapped in this pattern of white, 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 well, for maybe a very long time. Now I want to show you a really counterintuitive way to play around with this that I first saw a talk by Mark Holmes. I'll link his paper down in the description. So same setup as before, a white and a red ball in the urn. And I'm going to let T be the variable that denotes the length of time until you pick the first red ball. So, okay, what's the probability that the amount of time it takes is more than one? Well, it, it always takes at least one attempt to reach in. So the probability is one. Okay, but then the probability that it takes at least two steps, well, if it takes two, at least two steps, you must have selected a white ball on the first round. So maybe you select a white ball and it comes down a little bit like this. One white, one red, 50% probability. The probability of it taking at least two steps is one half. And then we can keep on going. Okay, so then we would select another wall ball. And if that one was again white, the probability that it would take at least three steps now would be the previous probability of one half times, well, there's two white balls, three balls overall, so multiply by two thirds. The twos cancel and you get this lovely value that this is just equal to one third. But let's keep going. Okay, so now we have this extra white ball. What's the probability it takes at least four steps now? Well, it's the same probability that we had previously, but now I have to avoid the red ball one more time Three white balls, four total, I multiply by three quarters, everything cancels nicely, and I get one quarter. And now I think I see the pattern. If I have a whole bunch of balls, the probability that it takes at least n steps is, well, it's the multiplication of all of those factors with the final n minus one divided by n, almost everything cancels, and I'm just left with the value of one divided by n. And one over n makes sense. I mean, this is a number that as n gets larger, gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So something really unlikely, like a whole bunch of whites, well, that's not going to happen all that often, just a 1 over nth probability. But now I want to change the question. I want to say, not just the probability, what should I expect the length of time to be? And for expectation value, we use this formula. The expectation of any quantity, so in this case the expected amount of time, is given by the sum of the values, the length of time here, that's going to be n, times the probabilities that it's going to be each particular value of n. This gives me the length of time I expect to have to wait until I get a red ball. Now, the n in this expression gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Like if I have a, to wait a really long time, it, it weights heavily in my average, but the probabilities go down. So it's a bit of a question of which dominates. But we know the answer, at least we know the answer for the probability of t greater than or equal to n. I can plug in the probability of t equaling n by doing 1 over n minus the tail, so 1 over n plus 1, and now it's just algebra. Okay, I can find a lowest common denominator of those. I notice that there's some cancellation on the top. I get some cancellation on the bottom as well, and what I'm left with is just the value of 1 over n plus 1. That expected time, the, the length of time you have to wait for a red ball to be chosen, well, this sum 
it actually diverges to infinity. It's a famous sum called the harmonic series and it diverges to infinity. So the expected wait time to get a red ball is actually infinite. And I mean, that's really bizarre because at the beginning it would sound like 50-50. Like it seems like it was quite likely you were gonna get a red ball. But because it's so painful when you get a long string of whites, it delays how long you're gonna take until you get a red, that this expected value turns out to diverge to infinity. But it gets weirder still. What if I tweak the problem a little bit? Like, okay, instead of having one white and two reds, I'm gonna increase to two reds, which sounds better, but I'm gonna let the number of whites be any large value that you like, I'll label it B. Like maybe a thousand or a million or a Google, it doesn't matter, an enormous number of whites. Now, this seems worse. Like if you're trying to figure out how long should I expect to wait until I get a red, you're like, there's a way lower probability of getting a red on that first draw, so shouldn't it be worse? But follow along carefully. We're gonna do the same calculation. Okay, the probability that it takes at least one step, well, it always has to be one, you always have to do at least one getting. The first time you reach in and select something, well, probably it's gonna be white. All I have to figure out is what was the chance of drawing a white? There was B whites, B plus two overall, so this ratio. And then I can continue. If I want to know the probability that it takes at least three steps to get a red, well, I have to avoid it on that first one. So I copy that down again, and I have to avoid it again. So now it's B plus one, there's one more white ball, over B plus three, there's one more total ball. No cancellation here, but it turns out that if I go one more further to the probability of T takes at least four steps, that I actually do, by the same argument, get a nice little cancellation starting to appear. And if you extend this argument out, well, here's the big long messy formula. Basically, every time I take a step of this, if I keep on drawing white after white after white, always avoiding red, then you always add one to the numerator, add one to the denominator. So I do that n times, a whole bunch of stuff cancels. And this final expression that I have here, well, let me just say it's less than or equal to a number over n squared. The numerator is just b and b plus one. There's a little bit more stuff in the denominator, but it doesn't matter. I'll just say it's less than the value of n squared. That's good enough for me. Okay, so the previous thing was a harmonic series, one over n. Some of you may know where this is going when you see one over n squared, but let's continue. So I'm gonna take that particular probability and same story, I wanna figure out what's the expected length of time until I get a red ball. Now I could do the same basic calculation I did before, but it's actually cleaner to use a little trick here. I can replace this expected value with something that looks a little bit cleaner in terms of the way it's given, the probability of t greater than or equal to n. The value of n gets absorbed in the change from p being t exactly equal to n to greater than or equal to n. This is called the tail sum formula. But if I plug that in, I get a sum of one over n squared. And famously, that series, it converges. And so at the end of the day, these two cases seem almost backwards. In the scenario with a ton of white balls, but only two red balls, it actually turns out that there's a finite amount of time that you can expect before you get a red ball. But, but in the case that seems better, one white ball and one red ball, well, it turns out in that scenario, it diverges to infinity. You're gonna have to wait forever. That's what you should expect to wait if you really wanna get a red ball. And part of the reason for this is that the harmonic series, that, that one over n, is right on the boundary between converging and diverging. And the real problem spot is a scenario when you have one red and a huge number of whites. Improving that to even two reds and a huge number of whites is enough to switch from diverging to converging. Now, you might have noticed the new studio angle, and this is made possible by my brand new standing desk. This was sent to me by FlexiSpot, who's the sponsor of today's video, and isn't it kind of awesome? I mean, it can hold my weight, so uh, that's pretty good. I love like getting into a uh, workflow and really grinding on a YouTube video, say. However, I find that after like 20 minutes of sitting in my chair, I get restless, my back starts hurting, my, my posture slumps over. So I really wanted a standing desk for those long grind times. And I actually have a really good office chair. Like a year ago, FlexiSpot sent me their uh, C7 office chair. It's held up really great, I like it. But I still want to do more than just sitting. And that's where the standing desk comes in. I really like the desk is made of thick automotive grade steel and not just like flexible aluminum as you'll unfortunately sometimes see. 
and it's got a 15 year warranty, 30 day money back guarantee. So you're pretty safe. Now, if you want 30 bucks off your own E7 standing bikes, use the link down in the description and use the code YT for YouTube E730. And if at checkout you say that uh, Dr. Trevor sent you in the notes, uh, they'll know it was from me. It would be greatly appreciated. And if you have any thoughts or questions about this video, leave them down in the comments and we'll do some more math in the next video.